it's the moment when your dream that you've had, maybe that you didn't even know you had it your whole life, but it's this thing that you're working towards. And it's one of those things where it's right there, but you just can't touch it. It's like behind this glass and you can't touch it, but you want it really bad. Uh, and then somebody calls you and says, Hey, I'm going to come move that glass for you tomorrow. Would that be okay with you? And I'm like, yeah, can you move that glass for me? He's like, yeah, sure. I'll move it for you right now. Hold on. I'll be there in a second. And then you have your dream in your hand. Welcome to the Author Like a Boss podcast, the podcast for indie authors who want to improve their writing, up-level their marketing, make money with their books, and have fun doing it. Now onto the show with your host, Ella Barnard. Hello, bosses. Welcome to Author Like a Boss. We are here today with Josh Hayes. So Josh, Hello. yeah. Hi, Josh. <laughs> Josh spent six years in the U.S. Air Force before joining a local police department where he's worked for 10 years. He is a community policing officer and an assistant bomb technician on their bomb squad, which means he's total badass and <laughs> like, like, like I read that and I was like, whoa, okay, <laughs> okay. so he also on the side, you know, he has <laughs> he writes. So he started a live YouTube show called Keystroke Medium, which is very clever with fellow author Scott Moon, which has turned into a very active community. He writes science fiction and fantasy. He's been invited to approximately 10 anthologies, a writing collaboration with Richard Fox, and he's been recruited to write a novel in Nick Cole and Jason Onspach's Galaxy Edge Universe. Wow. <laughs> Josh. Busy, busy, busy. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for taking some of your time to be here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> really excited to have you here. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So let's just jump right into it. So we're not taking too much of your time. <laughs> so oh, no, don't. I, I blocked out time. So I'm good. Okay. I'm not in a rush. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? And your author journey, because in the bio, I mean, obviously, you've got some crazy cool for for you. It's probably just typical. But for us, we're like, wow. <laughs> 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 wow. So how did this happen? The, you know, the the Air Force, the police, the bomb squad, and then also an author. <laughs> um, I, You know, it all happened kind of very naturally, actually. I, uh, you know, before I joined the Air Force and before I joined the police department. Uh, I, I wrote before any of that happened, um, not professionally and not that anybody read it, but, um, I started, uh, very young in my, uh, aspirations to becoming a writer and, uh, kind of started back in probably the early nineties, late eighties. Um, we lived in Germany with my dad who was in the army at the time and we got one channel AFN and uh, the Armed Forces Network, and um, they played uh, Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, and the episodes were probably like a month late. They weren't uh, the most current. Uh, but that's that was their, like, that was our weekly thing as a family. We'd watch Star Trek The Next Generation. I really got into it. And I really liked it. And uh, that really kicked off my kind of enjoyment and love of science fiction. And um, as we continued to like expand our um viewing of science fiction uh, late early 90s is when a lot of really cheesy science I mean, they still make cheesy science fiction movies but all they, they started coming out with a whole bunch of them and so we just watched all that we could and uh but by, by the time we moved back to the states in about 92 uh i think it was like 13 or 14 uh for some reason or another i don't know why i did it but i pulled out a little notebook, uh, a regular, uh, wide rule notebook and just started writing. And, uh, I've always read, uh, books too. I started out with the Hardy boys when I was really young and, um, progressed uh, all the way through, you know, the, the normal stuff like David Weber and star Wars novels and stuff like that. Uh, and, and for whatever reason, I just started writing that, that one story. I didn't know that it was a novel or a novella or a short story or whatever. I just was writing a story and uh i still have it somewhere um I, I finished it it was like 
I don't know, 120 pages front and back, maybe, or uh, maybe it was like 70 page, pages front and back. Uh, and then just continued from there and dabbled with it uh, for several years. I'd um, push it aside for several months at a time and come back and write a little bit more or start a project that I was really excited about. They can get bored with it and go off and do other things. And um, when I joined the Air Force, I uh, kind of got put on hold for a while. Um, and I, I really wasn't writing with any aspirations of becoming a writer, um, being paid to write or, you know, being a best selling author or anything like that. Uh, I just did it just, it was interesting to me, you know, you start uh, developing characters and worlds and you're like, Oh, this is really cool. I'd really like to be there. And, uh, after I got out of the air force, joined the police department, um, I met Scott, um, who had been writing his whole life as well. And, uh, Scott Moon, he's also on the the police department with me. And, and, uh, he introduced me to, um, well, self-publishing back in 2011, but it turned the phrasing changed to indie publishing. I like indie publishing better, but, um, when that happened is that's when really, I kind of was like, I can make money doing this and uh, enjoy it at the same time. And it just kind of took off. And um, I started writing really, really heavily and, and really kind of focusing on craft and different things instead of just writing to have uh, a meandering story, kind of like Stephen King, but <laughs> uh, just writing purposefully, you know, and, and um, Scott and I started uh, keystroke and, um, uh, uh, it was kind of off to the races at that point. Oh my gosh. I, you have more? Yeah. Keep going. Uh, it's been, oh, sorry. I, uh, <laughs> sometimes I ramble on, so I don't know if, uh, no. what I'm saying is interesting or not. There's like half a dozen things that I'm like, Ooh, I want to ask that, 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 but I'm wait, but I don't want to interrupt you. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's, uh, ask away, ask away. I, okay. I can ramble on for hours. I think, okay. Probably. There's a few things. One, Number one, engage. I have since become a TNG fan since I got married and my husband. Yes. <laughs> it's on Netflix. It's her like go yes. to, go to <laughs> TV I've gone show. Through that series on Netflix so many times. Yeah, so many times. <laughs> um, also, and it gets better every time. I think. It's 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 you find something else new. There's only a couple of episodes where I'm like. They're in France, and yet everybody has different English accents. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I right. can't handle this. But it's <laughs> it's too cheesy to not love. Um, oh. The other thing is, um, sorry, you guys, everybody, this is just me and my own personal interest. It's not about the writing, but I lived in Germany for a year. Um, where did you live in Germany? Uh, I lived in... It was a small, small uh, auxiliary base attached to Baumholder, Germany, which I think is like an hour and 45 minutes south of Frankfurt. Okay. Um, don't, so, don't quote me on the directions. No, uh, yeah. I was like nine or 10 when I lived there. Um, uh, but it was a very small base. Um, my dad was attached to a uh, anti-missile rocket kind of battalion. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. Um, but, I was yeah, just we curious. Because the school I went to, um, the school that I went to, because I went in high school, also yeah. all of the military kids, U.S. military kids, went to the same school. So I was like, how crazy would it be? <laughs> right. <laughs> if, yeah. Like, I'm just a tiny bit older than you. So how crazy would it be if we were both like in the same school? And now right. all these years later, we're like, oh, but nope, not quite. Because I was in Berlin. So, but close. Ah, uh, Berlin. Close. Yeah. Yep absolutely okay. very cool okay sorry you guys back on track so no, I that would have been really cool actually i know and that happened to me one other time so i was like that's crazy it could happen um okay so now i have a couple of things i want to know can you tell us a little bit about keystroke medium like what do you guys talk about on your on your youtube channel and and how did that start in did it start in conjunction with your writing yeah, so um, keystroke medium, um, I call it keystroke for short, so it's the same thing. But okay. uh, I 
so Scott and I, when we, when we first started talking about riding, um, we do it occasionally. We'd pass each other at work. We, we, at the time we didn't work in the same bureau, so we'd see each other occasionally and and stop and, and, you know, have 10 or 15, 20 minute conversations. And, uh, our friendship kind of grew from there. And then, uh, we started, um, having like weekly, we'd go to lunch or, or we'd go have coffee or something and just kind of talk about, um, writing and kind of what we were working on and, you know, getting each other's thoughts on different things. It wasn't really a writing group per se. It was funny. Cause I, I tell my wife, Hey, I'm going to go to my writing group. And she's like, you mean, you're going to go have coffee with Scott. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we're going to do. Uh, but so it, it, um, we'd meet at Starbucks or we'd go to like Chili's or whatever and just talk. And, uh, I've got, I've got four kids. I've got uh, two with my current wife and then two with uh, uh, my ex-wife. And uh, that particular weekend, uh, I had all four of them there and I could not meet Scott on our regular day. Um, and so I was like, hey, why don't we just like jump on the computer real quick and like just knock out our conversation and talk about stuff. And he was like, oh yeah, let's do that. So um, that kind of opened our eyes a little bit to like, Hey, we don't have to drive. Cause he lives on the, like Wichita is a pretty big town. And so it would either take him 30 minutes to drive here, or I would have to drive 30 minutes over to his side of the town. And so doing it on the computer, we're like, Hey, we could just do it on the computer and have coffee and not have to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And that it worked out a little bit better for both of us. And, uh, we did that for a few weeks and, um, you know, I listen to, to podcasts. I listen to like the SPP guys and um, uh, a whole lot of, I can't remember what Simon uh, Whistler's show used to be. It's not on anymore, but uh, I, I, anyway, I just had this idea. Like, what, what if we do a podcast? Like what if people, other people want to hear what we have to say? And at first he wouldn't really was sold on the idea. He was like, mm, okay, whatever. Um, so we, we started, broadcasting our conversations on, uh, I think we started out on blab, which doesn't exist anymore either. Mm -hmm. Um, and, <laughs> uh, we didn't really have a following on blab. We have several people watch just because it was on blab and they were on blab. So they came and watched, uh, and then blab went away. So we had to figure out a different way to do it. So YouTube was, uh, we could, when you do, um, YouTube, you actually use Google hangouts and so you can broadcast live to YouTube through Google Hangouts and it, then it stays on YouTube and you don't have to upload anything. It's just there. Ooh. <laughs> and so Scott and I were like, oh, that's easy. Let's just do that. Yeah. And so we just we started having our weekly writer meetings uh, broadcast on YouTube and we'd pick some topics and talk about them and nobody watched <laughs> and it was, it was horrible. Like, uh, our, our introductions were like just horribly done and not rehearsed at all. We had no idea what we were doing. And, um, I, I mentioned to him after about two months of doing, it, I was like, we should try to have a guest on and see how that works out. And he was like, all right, I've kind of like pulled Scott through, like, by it by it by it like he didn't really want to come and i like threw a chain around him i was like no we're doing this right now <laughs> and so we we there's another uh a writer his name is ralph kern he's from england he's also a cop and i was like hey that's a kind of a cool trifecta let's do that let's see if he wants to come on the show and he did and uh after the show he basically messaged us and said, Hey, I read your guys' stuff. I really liked it. I'm doing an anthology with this other dude, Nathan Highstead from Canada do you guys want in? And we were like, yeah, sure. We'll get in. And that spiraled into, uh, doing interviews of all the authors that were in the anthology and, uh, kind of the, it, it the show kind of blew up from there. And, um, uh, because of the show, like we had, uh, we had Richard Fox on as a guest. Um, we had, uh, Peter F. Hamilton, we've had Neil Asher, uh, Michael J. Sullivan's been on the show, David Weber's been on the show. Wow. Um, we've had uh, just several big name, big name authors. Michael Anderley's been on uh, a couple times. Uh, Craig Martell's been on several times. Um, 
but because of the show, um, which we started with absolutely no idea what we're going to do, it spiraled into this huge network of people that we now know. And so like you read in the, the beginning, we've, we got invited to all these anthologies to work on. Um, at the beginning of 2017, Richard contacted us and he wanted uh, to do some collaborations and then um, back in 2017, Nick Cole and Jason Onspot created their Galaxy's Edge universe, and uh, Legionnaire and uh, uh, Galactic Outlaws were coming out. And I sent them a message. I said, "Hey, if you guys ever open up for other authors to write, I want to write in your universe." And they said, "Write us a pitch," and I did. It took like three days, and I wrote them. Uh, I, I outlined an entire novel and sent it to them. And they said, that's great, but we're going a different direction. Cause I wrote kind of like a, a Han Solo esque type, uh, story with, um, uh, smugglers and whatnot. And they said, we're going a different direction. We're going with a kind of a military sci-fi vibe. And right now we're not going to open it up, but maybe later we will. And then Legionnaire, of course, uh, I don't know if you follow them or not, but their, their Legionnaire took off. And then their whole series took off and they've got six figure audiobook deals that are audio only. And, um, they've got, uh, Karen Travis now writing for them. Who's done star Wars and gears of war and all wow. this other stuff. And so anyway, they con they sent me an email, uh, last year and said, Hey, are you still interested to write? And I said, yeah, they said, all right, come up with a mill sci-fi book. Here's the Bible. And I read the Bible and I was like, which is their world universe deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, I said, uh, okay. And I did, uh, it's, uh, it's turned in, it's in edits right now. Um, and I think, I think they're going to start doing that series here in the summer. Uh, so anyway, that's a long, sorry, that's a really long answer to say we started keystroke to kind of just <laughs> talk about writing and it has basically turned us into, um, but it, it made our dream come true because now we're writing and getting paid for it. Yeah. I, I, I am totally okay with you taking that time because because what it showcases is something that I, I that I've told people and I try to emphasize with people I'm like especially with indie publishing being in a community of other writers is a big deal like being generous with other writers and building relationship with other writers in your genre makes a big difference because then you start doing anthologies then you start writing in each other's universes then you start you know and 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 when you're in an anthology so let's like i'm gonna go back to your when you when you invited uh i didn't write his name down but the guy the cop the police officer ralph, from, ralph kern ralph yeah kern. ralph kern so yeah. he's like so he's like hey let me you know let me invite you to this anthology. And then how many people, how many other authors were in that anthology that you went and you interviewed every single one of them on Keystroke, maybe on Keystroke? So uh, there were, f uh, in that first, in that first anthology, there were 14. And so that those interviews that we did weren't actually live uh, Keystroke shows. Those were specific to the anthology. We did a special run where we did all 14, we did all 14 interviews in like the span of two weeks. Mm -hmm. and then I edited them all together and we put them together as a collection of interviews f specifically for the anthology. Oh, wow. Cool. Uh, on top of our regular show. And then, uh, so we had, we had our weekly show uh, for a while. And then we were also doing all these short segment interviews that were basically all the same thing, just with like, we had the same questions, same, mm -hmm. same, set up for every author and they were about 15 minutes long a piece and uh, there it was fine i would never do it again that the, the production the production schedule to do 14 interviews like that yeah um <laughs> it, mm, man now you know it's, it's, it's crazy <laughs> Auth authors are crazy people and when you try to do 14 because we had we had people that were in england and in scotland and in ireland and mm -hmm. so you're talking about 12 13 14 hour differences and so sometimes scott and i would have to get up at like four in the morning which is what we do now anyway but we'd get up at four in the morning to hit an interview when they were going to bed you know so it's just crazy stuff yeah so but each of those each of those authors shared those interviews yep. with yep. their audience and Absolutely. then all of a sudden and each of those authors has their own audience and yeah there's crossover there's always crossover but but you have 14 or 15 or 16 if you count you and scott and you know like you got 16 right. people 
all sharing something and all of a sudden you're doing the work of your one wall. Not you. You're doing the work of 14 people. But but right. you, but, but you know what I mean? Like you're you yep. just have to reach out to your one group and then everybody and then you get the benefit of all the 14 the 14 people's their oh, yeah. audiences. So yep. um but I love how you did it very naturally. I like to uh you know, you can do it deliberately. You can do it deliberately, but the feeling still has to be of like this natural, gener- you know, like this gener- generous, natural, like, hey, we just want to help each other out. <laughs> right. And, you know, and, and that's exactly like that's that's Scott and I's outlook on everything. Every, everything that we've done since we started the company has uh, honestly, I can say 100 uh, percent that everything we've done for the company has been to better other riders. And to help them either meet new audience or, or, you know, become better at talking about their books. There's some authors that we have on that aren't very good about talking about their books. And so we help them um, formulate their thoughts and their words into this is how we talk about our books. Because the way we do our show is we try to split it. And uh, the first half of the show, we like to geek out, as we call it, about uh, our books and their books, mostly their books. And so if you can get an author talking about their characters and they get really excited about it, it's a whole lot easier to pull out how they got there than just jumping sometimes right into how did you write that book? Because then they're like, uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but if you can say, you know, this is your favorite character. Tell us about that. And they get really excited about their character and their book and stuff. Um, it helps them, uh, reach those, those people and, and say the things that they want to say. And, um, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of people that, that come back and say, Hey, thanks so much for, for having me on. I want to come back on. And, um, you know, so it's, it's been fun. Dude, you're coaching me right now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> like i'm thinking of a couple specific interviews where i'm like i could have done that and it would have been a better <laughs> it would have been a better show for and it's not the other person's fault because i'm the one who's guiding the whole process you know so i'm sure. like it's not your fault i'm the one who's supposed to know but i'm new um <laughs> <laughs> so i want to um delve into because because you know you're talking about all this stuff that you're doing and I because I asked you about it but but we haven't like talked about the writing yet so let's like what when is all this when is the writing happening because it feels like you know, you're still you still have your job as a police officer right okay so so um there's a lot of people that think I'm crazy and I I think I am uh, a little bit um we are. All the good people are. <laughs> um, so when you talk about, yeah, exactly. When you talk about time, um, I used to be caught up in the the whole, I don't have enough time to do, to write, you know? Um, and uh, I would get, you know, 20, 30, 100 words, 200 words a day, become distracted with, you know, everything that I needed to do during the day, whether it's kids or dishes or laundry or whatever. And, uh, I used to work second shift and for our department, that's, uh, basically 11 AM to 9 PM. And I'd write after I got home and, you know, you'd sit down to write and you're just drained through from the day and your mind doesn't work. And you're like, Oh, but I got to get these words done. And, um, and, it wasn't a good place for me. And I kept hitting these roadblocks of, uh, this is dumb. This isn't going to work for me. I need to figure something else out. So what I did was I, I I went to first shift, which is uh, basically 8 AM to 6 PM. And I get up, my alarm goes off at 4 AM every morning. And, uh, I usually drag myself out of bed by four 30. <laughs> if I, if I, if I get past that, my wife hits me because my snooze alarm pisses her off. And she's like, you need to stop hitting the snooze alarm and get out of bed. <laughs> so I drag, I drag myself downstairs. My coffee's already ready. It's on a pod on my desk next to my computer. Um, I take a drink and, you know, kind of gaze around 
uh, in the ether for a while. And then I start writing. And so every, every day before I start my actual work at, at my day job, I've got two and a half to three hours of, of writing in. Um, and usually that equates to something between 1500 and 2,500 words a day, just depending on how good of a flow I get into. And, uh, I do that every day on, on Saturdays, I sleep in till like five thirty, and on Sundays I sleep in till like six sometimes. Um, but every day my alarm goes off at four and, uh, I get up and do what I need to do. And, uh, I, it took a while. It took a really long time to make that the norm. Uh, there was several weeks when I started doing it that, that I'd go two or three or four days without getting up and I'm like, Oh, I'm so tired. Um, but once you train your body to do it, you know, it's just like anything muscle memory, uh, it's, it's much easier to do. So there's been several times, uh, here recently where I wake up before my alarm clock goes off and instead of going, Oh, I got five more minutes of sleep. I'll go back to sleep. I get out of bed and I go downstairs and I start working. And so it's just, you know, focusing on, 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 the time that I have to use instead of the time that I didn't use to write. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And because it's a really, I found, um, I've talked like the biggest, I've asked a lot of writers, what's your biggest challenge around writing? And the number one response, like by far (laughs) is finding time to write. That's, and that's the way they say it, finding time to write. And, um, and, and it's not a matter, it, it, it is a mindset shift, right? It's a mindset shift because you can be constantly searching for time to write. Or you can say, this is a priority. I'm going to make time to write. Because finding time and, and making time are two entirely different things. <laughs> oh, I, I 100% agree. 100%. Um, you know, and it's 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 the, the, the difference between finding time and making time, finding time when you're watching Netflix for two hours in the evening time, or, um, you know, assist, sitting and watching the news for an hour in the morning. Um, you're not going to find time there. You're mm-hmm. wasting time there. You have to, you have to tell yourself, go to your, wherever you, whatever you're going to do, whether it's writing or whatever, turn off the TV and go and do it. And that, that you just, if it's something that you want to do, you make the time to go do it. And you have to find that chunk. Like for me, it was something I didn't want to do, which was get up at four in the morning. I hate mornings. I cannot stand mornings. If I could sleep till 11 AM, like noon, I would be happy, but, uh, I can't do that and still do what I want to do. So I make myself get up and do it. And, uh, is the cost worth it? So yes, it absolutely is because I have gone from not making any money at all to, um, I'm not quite to where I can be a full-time writer. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but that's just because of my lifestyle. Like, um, uh, my wife and I have, uh, really good jobs and we have a certain type of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So, um, so somebody else maybe could come in and be like, yeah, this is enough for me to quit my job and live. (laughs) If I didn't have any kids, if if I was not married and I didn't have any kids, I'd be a full-time writer right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I've got other stuff that I've got to do now. I, I can, I paid off credit cards and, uh, you know, I, I can, we can go and do things that we don't have to think about do we have money in the checking account to go do this? Because we do. Um, and that's, but for me though, the, the reward isn't necessarily all the money. I mean, mm-hmm. it's great. It, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I can't believe how much money that I've made writing mm-hmm. uh, because it's just silly to me. Like it, a year ago, I wasn't making any money at all. Uh, six months ago, I was making no money at all on, on Amazon, on my books on Amazon. I would make between 30 and $50 a month. Um, and I was okay with that. Like, I was like, whatever, like I'll buy a cup of coffee and it paid for, you know, your website. uh, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like, 
uh, how many people's hobbies pay them 50 bucks a month? Like nobody's does. So mm-hmm. I was okay with that. But now that I'm, you know, I'm getting monthly royalty statements from my collaborations and it's, it's funny because I get, uh, royalties from the anthologies that I'm in that I don't even think they'll hit my PayPal. And I'm like, I didn't know I was getting paid for that this month. Sweet. <laughs> uh, and it's, you know, it's just, so you see all that happening and, and, um, and you see all the possibilities that have kind of opened up, uh, really just because of keystroke, uh, all these things have happened because of our show. Um, it just motivates me to keep going because if this has happened just because of this, then what else can happen if I keep pushing myself further? And, and that's, it excites me to, to, to think about what's going to happen at the end of this year. Um, because at the end of 2016, uh, Richard, I think, and so th- we can talk about that if you want, uh, the collaboration and how that worked. But when he called and asked if we wanted to do it, it was like kind of out of the blue. And we were like, uh, like that's, that's life changing, dude. And he was like, yeah. And, uh, to now, so 2016 to the end of 2016 to the beginning of 2018, so much has happened. And I, I'm, I'm really excited to see what's going to happen throughout the rest of this year and the next year and the next year after that. And, um, it's just like, it's a snowball, you know, once it starts rolling, it just keeps going. And so you were going to say, you were going to say, cause I asked, is it, is the cost worth it? It's this, you know, the cost is getting up at four in the morning, not being able to sleep until 11. And you're talking about, um, well, it's not even just the money. Is it this excitement or what is this other, the other part of it that's, yeah. I mean, that's what it is. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's knowing that people are reading, uh, and enjoying what I like. And that's, that's really cool to me. I, I look, I would write if nobody read my stuff probably. Um, but you know, getting emails from, from readers, um, uh, or, you know, just interacting with people in the keystroke group on Facebook that have found us and enjoy hanging out with us and talking with us. That stuff's motivating to me. Like, I love that kind of interaction with people and, and peers and readers alike. And so all of that, um, the money is great, but, um, just the collective atmosphere that we've kind of created and, and, uh, grown out of keystroke and, and writing uh, is motivating to me. And that's why, like, I'm just pushing myself all the time. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And and that's, it's hard to explain. I, cause I have something similar, like this podcast, <laughs> this podcast and talking to creative people about what uh, taking action and achieving their dreams is my dream. <laughs> like, like, and there's right. something so fulfilling, about waking up in the morning and knowing that I get to do what I truly, truly, truly love every day. And it's worth it to all the cost is worth it because this is, this is what I get to do. Like, (laughs) and, and the top and these conversations will help other people achieve their dreams. (laughs) <laughs> like that yes. oh oh the response i cry when i somebody's like oh my gosh i feel so motivated to do it and i'm like you know so um so the cost is you know getting up I, when you said sometimes i sleep until 5 30 i was like whoa that's late and i'm thinking like <laughs> like it was like so not in my mind 5 30 in the morning <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? And then I was like, oh my gosh, he meant 5.30 in the morning sleeping. <laughs> yes, right. Exactly. Yeah, like this, this morning, I, I, I have two alarms on my phone, the 4 a.m. alarm and the 5.30 a.m. Uh, alarm. And so, you know, Monday through Friday, I'm setting the, the 4 a.m. one. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, I hit the 5.30 one. I'm like, oh, I get an extra half an hour or hour and a hour half. And a half. It's so exciting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. But I love that commitment. And I am going to ask you about the collaboration, but I'm going to share my sister. Um, she's always she's a writer. And she's always wanted to be, she has kids and um, her husband works and she was staying at home. And what she would do is she would get up at 430 before all the kids woke up. Yep. But then at one point, one of the, I guess she had, you know, one of her other kids was an early riser. So she's like, oh my gosh, I can't, when am I going to get up at three in the morning? Like it's not doable. So she would, she would take her kids to Ikea (laughs) 
because <laughs> because ikea has a play area for the kids oh, while nice. you shop and then yep. um and then and they were like fa- that you can you can leave them there for one hour but if you're a family if you're a member of ikea's like f- free thing then you get an extra half hour so she would have an hour and a half and then and if you're a member you get like free <laughs> coffee right oh, <laughs> so right. she would she'd go over to the little you know eating area with her computer her laptop yep. and leave her kids in the ikea play area and she, ikea she also purchases a lot of stuff at ikea okay so <laughs> like, like don't worry she spent her money but like it was that difference between finding time to write and making time to write she's like this sure and then she'd get her kids a breakfast and they'd you know, like, but I'm like, oh, it's so amazing. Like when you that when you have the commitment, it's not a matter of finding a time. It's a matter of where can I make this time? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, and I share I share that for people. So I'm like, if you live near an IKEA, you can do this. <laughs> it's you know, it's funny that you mentioned the kid being an early riser because when I when I started making the transition to 4 a.m., my son, my youngest son, um, was I think he was like six or seven or eight months old and he was, um, as soon as I made that transition, he started waking up early. Like he'd get up at like five and, and I'd be sitting at the computer at like four 30 and, uh, I'd start writing it at five. He'd start crying and I'm like, Oh, you've got to be kidding me. You're (laughs) killing me, man. You are like, get up early specifically because you're sleeping. You're messing with my time here. Then what happened? Oh uh, well, that hap- <laughs> that went on. So that went on for probably a couple months. So, but, but see, my wife is also an early riser. She'll get up and she'll go to the gym at like four thirty. Okay. Um. So we had to come to an agreement where uh, every other day was a day that I got to write for for sure, uh, and that she would stay home and like walk on the treadmill or something. And then on the other days, I would go down to write. And if the kids woke up, then I'd, I'd go get them. But now they sleep all the time. So now it's okay. okay. Well, it, these things are good, though. Like, there's a lot of people, like, I know you're, you're feel, you might be feeling like you're getting to the, but these kind of details and compromises that you make for your, for your marriage and for your writing and to make right. it all work are important because people are like, well, how did you do it then? <laughs> like, how did right. that work right. for everybody? Oh, yeah. And oh, so, it, it, yeah, it, it's, good. It, uh, it definitely <laughs> takes, you know, it, it takes, uh, you know, if you're, if you're married or, you know, live with a significant other or whatever. I mean, it, 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 it's definitely has to be a team thing. And, uh, one of the, the biggest hurdles that, that we had in our relationship. And then my, with my writing was that, um, I used to work a lot of part times and one of the part times I used to work at, I could sit and write. And then it, it started out to be really great. Like I was like, yes, I can sit and write for four hours while I'm at this part time. Well, then the part time started to get busier and I couldn't get that four hours of writing time. And, uh, one of the things that happened with my collaboration with Richard is that, uh, when we turned in the, the first draft of our novel, uh, he'd pay, he'd pay me in advance. And so, um, he asked, what do you need for that month? um, to cover what what would you need for a month of expenses if you quit your part-time and you can start writing the second book. And I told him and he said, okay, done. And I was like, Oh, hold on. Let me talk to my wife first. (laughs) And so basically what I told my wife is I'll quit this part-time Richard's going to give me an advance. But if I quit this part-time, then I have to be able to go downstairs for the time that I was going to be at the part-time. So on like the four hour block that I would work at, at my part-time, I would take that time and transfer it into sitting in front of the computer at home on whatever day it was. And so it it was, we, it it took her a while to see like the value of that and why I needed to do it. Because a lot of people that aren't writers don't understand that the books just don't appear. You actually have to type on the keys for the, the amount of time it takes to type those words. And um, it really took her a while to kind of get into the, okay, he's going to have his writer time and I'm not going to be bitter about it, or I'm not going to be upset about it or, or whatever. She's extremely supportive. And, uh, if, if I hadn't had that support, it probably would have been a lot, uh, a lot more of a rockier journey to get to where I'm at because, you know, we weren't pulling in the money. Uh, you know, with Amazon, it takes 
two months to get paid even after you start making money. So Mm -hmm. like I, I finished book one of our collaboration series in, uh, no, what did I, November, I think September or November of 2017 is when I finished the first book, but I didn't get my first paycheck for that book until February of 18. So it, there was a long time where I didn't get, I was not getting paid regularly and I didn't have a part-time. So there was a lot of struggle there. Um, but, I, but I was, I was still always writing and, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, it worked out. And, and once she saw the money, she was like, yeah, go down and write. What are you doing? I'm like, go make some more money. <laughs> Why are She's you like, we're fine. Me? We're go fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. It's not an instant gratification. Okay. People have been waiting this whole time and you did kind of touch on it a little bit. We want to know about the collaboration. Yes. Okay. So, okay. um, so Richard Foxy writes uh, some military science fiction. His series is called the Ember war. Um, I picked it up on a fluke from uh, an audible one uh, band. It was 2014 2015 i can't remember what season we had him on the show um but i listened to it on audible and i loved it absolutely loved it his characters were great his action was great um and being formal military and also law enforcement it's really if, if it's a bad military science fiction book i it really irks me and i and i've gone through several uh false starts on books that i'm like that seems like a really interesting premise I want to read that book or I want to listen to that book. And then I get into it and I'm like, this is horrible. This person was obviously not in the military. They don't know anything about rank structure. They don't know anything about operations. And it just kills the book for me personally. It it might be a good book and other people might like it, but it doesn't work for me. And so when I picked up Richards, it absolutely hit home. It was a great book. The series was phenomenal. Uh, Listened to it straight through. We had him on the show several times. Um, He became friends with us, uh, Scott and I. He was a regular uh, watching the show and and hanging out with us and talking. And um, kind of out of the blue, um, he sent me a message and he was like, hey, so question, how much money would you have to make a year to quit your job? Because, uh, um, it, I mean, it wasn't a secret. Scott and I have always talked about wanting to go full time and, 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 uh, either retiring or getting out of law enforcement to, to write full time. And, and, uh, he said, uh, actually his first question was what would your wife like to stop working? And I said, absolutely. My wife hates working. And he said, well, how much money would she need? And my wife makes quite a bit of money. She makes more money than I do. And I said, well, <laughs> that's a lot. I, I'd, be able to, I'd be able to quit before she would. And he goes, well, how much money would you have to make? And I told him and he said, okay, so we can do that if you want to do this. And uh, I said, can I call you? And he said, yeah, sure. And he gave me his number and we talked. We talked on the phone for like three hours probably that night. And I got off the phone and I immediately called Scott and because he told me he was going to offer Scott the same thing. And Scott and I talked about it. And it was one of those, I don't know if you've ever had one of these moments. I've, it's only happened to me one time. And that was this, um, when it's the moment when your dream that you've had, maybe that you didn't even know you had it your whole life, but it's this thing that you're working towards. And it's one of those things where it's right there, but you just can't touch it. It's like behind this glass and you can't touch it, but you want it really bad. Uh, and then somebody calls you and says, Hey, I'm going to come move that glass for you tomorrow. Would that be okay with you? And I'm like, yeah, can you move that glass for me? He's like, yeah, sure. I'll move it for you right now. Hold on. I'll be there in a second. And then you have your dream in your hand. And Richard did that for us. And it was, and he didn't do it. Um, he didn't do it f- uh, for any, uh, self aggrandizement or any, uh, deep seated personal like agenda that he had for whatever he, he just was generally, he wanted to, uh, he wanted to write more books in his universe. He didn't have the time to do it. And he wanted to help us kind of reach uh, that level or the next level. And so we jumped on it and, uh, the, he said, well, what do you want to write about? Like what, what excites you about the series? And, and like I said, I've read, read all of his books so I knew the characters and I knew the story and I said, honestly, I, I want to write something that is, if I'm going to write something, I want to have 
my own characters mostly because I don't feel like I can do your characters justice because those are your characters. And he said, so I've got this place called Terra Nova and this is where um, halfway through his series, some of humanity goes to because of uh, the Ember War, which uh, uh, they fight these uh, aliens called the Zaros uh, during the, the nine book Ember War series. And they're, they basically wipe out every uh, intelligent species in a galaxy and so halfway through the series the humans are losing and they think we're going to lose and they find this other galaxy and they've got all this tech and hand wave them and whatever it's not interesting but they go we're going to go set up another colony out here but the catch is we can only get there like every 20 to 30 to 60 years because of gravity tides and blah what have you and he said we can go out there and you can write whatever you want out there and it doesn't affect what goes on in this universe and people want to know that story and i want to tell that story and i've got a really good idea about what we're going to do with it and this and that and i said yeah sure and so we spent two or three months plotting it out and um uh we had all these characters and all these these uh things plotted out and and ready to go and then he called me this is funny richard's very he's a very odd guy if you get him on the show he, he's he's a great guest to have and he said, hey, what if we make the main character, who we named him uh, Carson, so what if we make him a girl? And and I said, I like that. Let's make him a girl. And he's like, all right, he's a girl. And so right before we started drafting the book, we changed the main character of the book to uh, Carson, Kit Carson. And uh, it, that made the book for me. It, it changed everything about it. And uh, basically it's about – uh, the second expedition to Terra Nova and they get there and this other colony that's been there for 20 years, uh, which should be flourishing and growing and producing, uh, is empty. It's abandoned and no one's there. And, um, they don't know why, uh, they go down to the planet and they get uh, attacked by what we call the, the nether guard. Um, they're basically some, uh, biomechanical, uh, grown, uh, hybrids, um, and they have this, uh, mystery about what happened to the colonists and what are these other aliens here? And then they, they find this basically alien prison, uh, and have to figure out where the human colonists are. And it's, it's, um, it's a really, really fun story. And we get to kind of play around with anything we want because the, the galaxy is brand new to us and to the reader. So, uh, we create brand new characters. Uh, the main character in his Ember War series, Ken Hale, comes with the uh, expedition, and he, be, instead of being a military character, he's now kind of the governor. And he has several scenes and several arcs in the book, um, but he's he's not the main character. Kit uh, Kit Carson is, and um, we published that book in December. And uh, we published the second book, which is Bloodlines, in February of this year. Yep. Okay. So we yeah we published we published book one in well I can tell you uh, we published book one I think in November yeah end of November 2017, and then book two we published in uh, March published in March and. Um, I'm, I just started book three. Um, I just finished the first chapter of book three this morning and that should be out, um, this summer. I had to stop, uh, between books two and three, I had to stop to finish my galaxy's edge novel, uh, for Nicole and Jason Hansbach. And so that, uh, pushed back the production table on book three for Terra Nova. Good kind of problems to have. <laughs> i have no time i have all these stories in no time <laughs> these are the good problems yes. um so how many books had you written before richard reached out to you for this collaboration uh so i'd written eight short stories for various anthologies various genres uh, I wrote a mystery one. Uh, the rest of them were basically science fiction. Uh, I wrote one superhero um, short story, which I'd never even thought about writing in that genre until a buddy asked me to write in his anthology. And I was like, yeah, I'd never done it before. Why not? 
Uh, and then my own books, I have three books uh, in my second star series, um, which is not finished. It's supposed to be four books. I have no idea when I'm going to get to the fourth book because that series doesn't uh, pay as well as the series that I'm writing now. Um, so I'm hoping to finish it uh, either by the end of this year or 2019. We'll see. Um, but that second star is basically a um, uh, a science fiction reimagining of Peter Pan. And uh, Peter Pan is the bad guy. And uh, you have all the other characters that are in the the, the original story, Win- Wendy and Michael and John. And um, it takes place on an alien world um, with uh, uh, some asteroid meter dust that uh, prolongs everybody's life. And uh, it, it's a little fun tale. It's not military science fiction. It really kind of doesn't fit into a genre. It's just general science fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, everybody that's read it, everybody that's read it has liked it for the most part. Um, but it doesn't have as wide an audience as uh, it's the not ter- an obvious audience. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, wh- how did, um, how did the plotting happen with like, so you guys, you're like me and Richard spent two, two, yeah. three months plotting. How does that happen? So, uh, I, I've never been a plotter until, uh, really right before I started doing Terra Nova. And even then I really wasn't a plotter as in the, in the sense that I am now, but now, um, I plot out my books now from beginning to end before I even started writing. And so with Richard, what we'll do is, We'll have two or three story meetings, um, and during those meetings, we'll take notes on the major plot points that we know we want to have have happen, uh, some things that might be cool to have happen, and then what we really don't want to have happen. And so, what we'll do, uh, what we did for the first book is we talked about what we wanted to do with it. Uh, we talked about our characters, and Richard spent uh, probably about a week writing the outline for book one and it was about a 14,000 word outline and he sent me that and he said here you go that's the book write it and i said fantastic and i did um i pretty much followed the outline um completely there were certain things that i changed because i felt like uh, uh, as i was writing it that the characters wouldn't do or say what they had uh lined up in the outline to do or say so i changed uh, some of those things uh, and a lot of the things I changed didn't really affect the overall um, flow or where the story was going. Um, but so we'll, the way we write is we will plot out each character group, their arc. So in Terra Nova, there's, there's three characters, three uh, arc groupings. Uh, one is Carson and her Pathfinders. One is Jared Hale and the aliens. And another one is Ken Hale and the colony. And we'll plot out each one of those arcs separately and um, then put them together in narrative order later. And that's how I write them. So we'll once we get the entire outline done and it's put together in narrative order, then I will go back, pull out the plots, uh, pull out the arc groupings and write that entire arc from beginning to end. Um, and then after they're done, put them back in together again, because I feel like that helps the, um, connection from scene to scene. When you get back, when you leave a character group and then read some instances in in somewhere else or another POV, and then you come back writing it all in one shot helps that, continue uh, continuality uh, between the scenes and it, it really helps it flow a little better um so the the first book he wrote fourteen thousand words in an outline and then i wrote sixty five thousand words on a book and then the second book he we talked about it he sent me a five thousand word outline and i wrote seventy three thousand words <laughs> and uh i think our outline now uh that i wrote i, I we pretty much uh, half and half this outline eh, probably 70 30 me 70 percent me 30 percent him on this outline mm-hmm. uh, uh it's about eight thousand words and i'm pretty sure the book's going to be about seventy five thousand words ish um and 
I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do you solid. This, so I've never told anybody this before, and Richard would probably be mad that I'm telling you this. So uh, we met in February. I went to Vegas uh, for a work deal, and we met, and we we ironed out some of the big deals for plot uh, uh, in book three. And I said, I'm really interested in. We were talking about the length of the series, and I, I think a lot of series they get overdone. Like you have like 18 books in a series and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, I don't want to start that book. I don't want to read 18 books in a series. So we were talking about how long we wanted Terra Nova to go. And I and we had it originally plotted for five. And he said, you know, the book's doing really well. We can take it to nine if you want or whatever. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, no, I don't think that I want to go past what we already have outlined because I feel like we would stretch and people would would see the stretching because it, 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 there's just not enough there in the story that we want to tell for the original uh, Terra Nova story. And I said, but what I do want to do is write a story that takes place after the events of Terra Nova. And, uh, I want to write that as like a, uh, a firefly slash Andromeda type series where it's on a ship, but you've got all these different aliens and and characters on the ship that interact together and they go and they do fun things and they have a mystery or whatever. And then there's some big overarching thing that happens that they get involved in. And, And I said, what I, what would be really cool is if, uh, I just do that and that would bridge people from, it would be like a, a bridge from Richard and Josh to Josh writing in Richard's universe, then to just Josh and writing in Josh's universe. And it would be kind of an easy bridge for readers. Mm -hmm. And he said, I really like that idea. And so he said, I, for the next couple of books, I want you to take more of a control in writing the outlines because I want you to end up with characters that you're going to need in your books. And so for book three, I'm starting to steer the characters and the, the plot to how it's going to affect this other series that I'm going to write after we're done. And I created a really, really cool character for book three. That's a, uh, it's a robot, uh, Android type, uh, AI, um, that is a spy, but also has a uh, split personality, basically, where one, one, one side of his intellect is like it really, 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 really smart and very like uh, computer like in its thought process. And Data? The other, yes. Uh, <laughs> but the other half is it, he's a spy and he's supposed to be like kind of fitting in with these all these biological aliens. So the other half is uh, developed as a personality. So he can have a personality and kind of read what other people are doing. And so the personality side and the computer side conflict sometimes. <laughs> and and so you're going to have a lot of really neat internal dialogue between the data side of his personality and the side that's like, no, nah, I'm OK. We're good. Let's do this. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be really fun. That is awesome. That's so much fun. I it sounds like, and tell me if this is true, it sounds like, and this is my last, one of my last questions. <laughs> this is so much good stuff in here. Maybe I might invite you. Like, if you're open to, I would love to interview you again later. We could have some other, in a few months, maybe once you, once you're doing your, uh, your like, series. Like we yeah, it's, it's, I know. Um, I don't want to take oh, too much of your time. I'm really sorry, interested. Sorry for hogging the mic. No, no, no it's Next really, time, really I good go stuff. So, um, Wow. So Richard, in the process of him, the, so the first book he did 14,000 words on the outline and then you wrote that. So was he teaching? Is this like a mentoring teaching process um, for you at all? Uh, it is in the, in the sense that I, um, so I had to teach myself how to write books like Richard. Mm-hmm. And he has a, he has a very strict kind of thought process when it comes to his books and when it comes to his structuring. I think uh, the the number one compliment that Richard gets on his books is uh, that his pacing is pretty much perfect. And so when he structures his books, he looks at the the pacing and the structure more than anything else to make sure that it's in line with everything else that he's already done. Mm. Uh, 
And so that was one of the things that I had to kind of take into account when I'm, when I'm writing and when I'm outlining and planning is look at the structure of this book. And it has taught me a lot about um, estimating size of a book um, and estimating what I'm going to need to tell the story um, and how to make sure that in structurally things are going to happen when they need to happen and not just when I, when I say, Oh, that'll be fun. Let's do that. Now. Um, we, to get to the fun part, we need to kind of structure it so that it, when it gets there, it has more of an emotional and a reader impact than just putting it in there just because we think it's fun. And so that has been a, a big learning experience for me. And I think I, I know that it's made my, my writing better working with, with him and, and getting his thoughts and edits when he reads the draft, he'll send it back. And, um, have all these corrections and no, we need to do this and we need to explain this more over here. And so it's, 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 it's changed my writing, but for the better, definitely. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome. Okay. So, um, we've talked a lot, we've covered almost all my questions, even without me asking them. (laughs) Like, like I'm like I'm like I don't need to ask you how you stay motivated or any of these things because we already covered it. But um, what advice would you give to other authors who want to you know have the success that you are having now? Um, so that's a uh, an excellent question, and I I love talking about this because there are so many people out there that want to be authors. Um, sometimes I think everybody that wants to write their, their sole goal is I want to be a full-time writer. Um, uh, and that's not as it's easier said than done for sure. Um, and a lot of people I have seen over just over the last four years since I've, um, got into the indie community and, um, kind of ingratiated myself with, with hundreds of these authors is I've seen, authors that start out thinking that their product is going to hit and do exactly what Andy Weir did, or it's going to be a a huge smashing hit like uh, Game of Thrones. And when it's not, they immediately think that it's somebody else's fault, Uh, or they put the blame on you know, the marketing didn't work right, or, you know, they just didn't like the book or they don't understand, or, um, it's because this person didn't do something or the editor messed up or whatever. They put all the blame on somebody else. And that really turns me off. But you also have the people that, you know, their first two books didn't do well. and The third book didn't do well. And they're like, oh, I'm, I quit. I'm done. Obviously it's not for me. I'm going to go do my own thing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something else. Um, so I have two thoughts about that. One is, um, writing is not for everyone. Uh, and if you get to a point in your life where writing is something that, you know, really just pains you to do and you, you absolutely cannot stand doing it and you just rather be outside sitting in a lawn chair, you know, fishing, which is absolutely a great thing to do. But if you'd rather be doing that than writing, then don't write. Um, if you really, really want to do it and you really want to become successful at it, my number one uh, piece of advice would be find a community that you can share your experience with. And b- by sharing your experience, that's not finding a community and posting links to your book to sell. Um, finding a community that you can share your experience with and I'll use keystroke just as an example. Um, people in keystroke in the Facebook group and even on, during the live show, we talk about writing, we talk about different things. Um, you know, but when somebody asks this question, Hey, what do you guys think about this? Can I do this in my book? Or what do you think about this character doing this? And people help and people, we talk about things and we talk about, you know, certain processes and, and what will be better for me. And, you know, they ask, I'm doing something wrong here. What am I doing wrong? And, and we help and, and, and we lift each other up. And it's, it's, it's that thing where they always say writing is a lonely career and it can be, 
Um, but it doesn't have to be. And you, because there's so many, the internet brings so many people close together that it does not have to be a lonely thing that you do. And the bigger your network is and the bigger your community is, and the more you're willing to put yourself out there and talk with people, the better you're going to do in the long run. And so I started doing this in 2012 ish. It's 2018. So four years now. Um, and it took me three and a half years almost four years to get, um, my first real paycheck. And so when you look at that time invested, a lot of people are like, you want me to do this for four years before I even get paid. Mm -hmm. And they don't like that. They, they can't stand that idea. And so like Scott and I, we motivate ourselves all the time. If our sales don't do well or whatever, we're like, would you be doing this if you didn't get paid? And we're like, yep, we would be. So keep doing it. We're good. Um, so if you want to be a successful author, know that there is a lot of things that you have to do to be a successful author, whether it's going the traditional route or the indie route. It's not just a, I'm going to make a million dollars on my book. I might make $50 and that's okay with me because I'm going to go buy a cup of coffee and then think about writing some more while I'm drinking a cup of coffee. And if that makes you excited, then find a community you want to hang out with, whether it's Keystroke or like the 20 book show or, uh, SPP guys to have a great community to follow them. Uh, or you, I mean, make your own, um, and talk with other people and, and hang out and, and build your network and stay motivated through there. Um, you having the network will make you successful. Mm. And I mean, Scott and I are, are, are living proof of that because we had nothing before we started our community. We had absolutely nothing. And now we have a, a show, we have novels on our shelves. We have anthologies on our shelves. We have people asking us to be on their podcast, them, <laughs> to be on their, exactly. <laughs> to be on their podcast. And, <laughs> and that's exciting. Like everybody, like, um, I'm not a superstar. I'm not anybody famous. Like you say who Josh Hayes is. They're like, I don't know who that guy is. Um, and, but I love talking to people about writing. I love doing interviews like this. Um, I'll definitely come back on your show. You were very, very enjoyable to talk with and very easy to talk with. I'm sorry. I kind of cannibal cannibalized all your, your time here. I, what? I, I no. get talking and then, no. and then I, I ramble and I go off on tangents. So dude, it but was anyway. all good stuff. <laughs> okay, so his his main the, just to just to paraphrase, so the main advice is only do it if you want to do it, regardless of whether you're getting paid. Yep. And two, once you've made that choice, like or decision, or or once you're in that mindset of I would do this regardless, find a community of people. And Absolutely. and and my, my business partner partner Megan and I, we have that same thing. It's one of our top three. <laughs> advice to people yep. is find a community whether it's our community at all are like a boss or it's you know wh whatever your community is find a community we call them yay sayers oh <laughs> instead yeah of absolutely instead of naysayers <laughs> like, like find your yay sayers because it doesn't have to especially with indie especially i think with indie publishing it makes yes. um having the community is the key to your success i think Absol really absolutely i 100 percent um, believe 100%. And there's so many levels of it, even just in the keeping motivated, plus the marketing, plus the right. Like, there's so many levels of where where the community makes a difference. It's 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 hard to even to emphasize all like how important it is. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Um, okay, go ahead. You've talked a bit about your books, and they're really exciting. I have never been so much of a sci-fi, but as I'm talking to a lot of these uh, sci-fi space opera authors. <laughs> I'm like, I might need to branch out because I don't think sci-fi is the same as it as it was when I was younger and and you know exploring the different it's, genres. You know, it's, it's got a little bit of a stigma to it for some for whatever reason. For, it's got a little stigma. I to it. I think for and, women more. Right. Like right. like when I was younger and just starting out, I was like, the women in this are not people that I want to look up to. You know. <laughs> Right, like, right, but I think exactly. it's different now, and so I'm, I'm, um, when I have more time to read, I am going to start branching out into some of these other, um, some of the, some of your guys's books. It's very exciting. Yes. Okay, very cool. so go ahead and tell us about the the latest books 
and where people can find you and them. So um, Bloodlines is the most recent book that I have out. It's the second book in the um, Terra Nova Chronicles. Um, And this is basically um, a spoiler alert, but uh, after the first book, they find the human colonists and they figure out what's going on. And uh, in book two, they have to go find allies to to fight these uh, uh, big bad aliens that are causing a whole bunch of ruckus. And so so Bloodlines, you find uh, Carson going off um, to these uh, new worlds and meeting these new uh, alien races and and um, trying to enlist some help to save their uh, their colony. And I'm working on book three, um, which uh, it should be done this summer. Um, my writing schedule tells me that I should have it done by the end of June, but my reg- writing schedules have been wrong before, so <laughs> <laughs> we, we will see. Um, and uh, the audio book is being done by Luke Daniels right now. Uh, Podium Publishing bought the audio rights um, like not 24 hours after we published the first book. They bought the audio wow. rights. Wow. And so they are doing a publisher's pack which with book one and two. And I'm not sure when it's going to come out. I think they're recording now. Um, but I'm kind of out of the loop on that a little bit is because they podium does their own thing. And then mm-hmm. they say, okay, it's ready. And then, all right, they listen to it. So, okay. um, but I had to send them, um, pronunciations of all the alien species and yes. uh, different words and stuff so they can get everything <laughs> right. Uh, so they, they got those. So hopefully they'll, they'll, uh, he'll do a good job. Luke Daniels is a really good reader. And, and then uh, keystroke medium. Yes. Dot uh, com. You can find, Keystrokemedium.com is our is our company website. My my personal website's joshayswriter.com. I don't update it a whole a whole bunch, but uh, uh, you can find all my books there. Um, Keystroke Medium on Facebook is where you'll find me most of the time. Okay. Uh, we're the only Keystroke Medium out there. If you Google Keystroke Medium, you'll get all of our shows. You'll get a website. You get our Facebook page. We're the only one out there. Um, we we live broadcast uh, right now. We live broadcast Monday mornings, uh, eleven a.m. U.S. Central Time uh, Mm -hmm. every day. Um, We're talking about going to evenings. It's not set in stone yet, but but right now it's 11 a.m. Monday mornings. Uh, We broadcast live. Um, We either will have a guest uh, tomorrow, which is the 7th of May. We don't have a guest. Uh, We'll be doing uh, kind of an AMA type deal, and I'm going to be talking about some uh, Scrivener for beginner tips. Um, And uh, all of it's on YouTube as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can find awesome. every, one of our, every one of our episodes are on YouTube. Yep. So even if you can't find them live, you can find them on YouTube, the website. And then, um, and since he's in the Facebook group, I'm assuming you do like me where even if somebody has a question after the live, you will still respond to it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Oh my gosh. There was so much covered in here and the, and yet there was still so much more I wanted to ask you. So we'll have to have you back. Thank you so much for being here, Josh. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I'll, I'm, I'm glad to come on whenever it was, it was a blast. Thank you for having me. Okay. On. Awesome. And thank you everybody for listening. Um, go ahead and check us out at authorlikeaboss.com. Hugs and happy authoring. Welcome to the Author Like a Boss podcast, the podcast for indie authors who want to improve their writing, up-level their marketing, make money with their books, and have fun doing it. Now, on to the show with your host, Ella Barnard. 